It's muted. Good evening. I don't know. You, you thought two, two years of Zoom oh, saying you're on mute. It. How's that working? I hope that's a bit better. Um, let's. Sorry, guys. Hello. Welcome to the Online Wine Tasting Club, and hopefully you can hear us now. Do let us know in the chat if there's still any problems. Um, we're going to New Zealand tonight, and we're very much looking forward to it. It's a place that there's so much to discover, and um, um, although we, we often think of it as just this one tiny place, don't we? And I think, I think that's what, what's important, is the fact we go, oh, we've done New Zealand, we've done South Africa, we've done... The, yes. To try and do one country in six <laughs> wines, let alone, awesome. you know, yeah. even, a, even a region trying to do, you know, when we've done Rioja previously, yeah. trying to do that in six wines is absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. So we are back to New Zealand to do a tour of, you know, some wineries we, you know, we've seen and loved before, mm -hmm. but different wines for them, some different regions. But let's get the first wine in the glass, because that's really important. And as I pour I these... Alex can talk a little bit about Slido and tasting notes and all that kind of stuff yes. for anyone who's joining us for the first yes. time. So if you have been with us before, welcome back. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you for sticking with us. And um, it is a pleasure to spend an evening with you as always. Um, we love to do these interactive tasting notes because Jamie and I could talk to you until we are, you know, frankly, old and grey. Oh no, we are already old and grey, but we could talk to you for a very long time about what we taste in the wine but everybody's taste is different. So we love to let you put your tasting notes in so that you can say what you taste because different people from different cultures, different people with different food backgrounds, all bring different perspectives and that's a wonderful thing to bring to it. So we don't want to impose our views on the wine. Um, but yeah, we're kicking often. off with a, well, no, absolutely. But preferably not that often. So I'm gonna move it on so you can now go to either to that slido.com one, um, as is uh, described in the, uh, um, the, uh, the the website you can see there, um, or you can go to TOWTC.com dot co uk slash taste, and that's where you can pop your notes in. Um, oh, it has gone on two wines. I thought it had. That's ridiculous. We'll go back but anyway, so one, well, we? well, well, yes. Yeah, so we're on wine one. So either scan in uh, TOWT slash taste or slido.com with the code in the corner there. Yeah. And There's get those QR tasting notes well, in. There's so a QR code for you. But we are starting down in central Otago. So mm -hmm. we're in the South Island, going down about as far south as we get, um, growing wine down there. And what's really interesting about this particular region, you can see it on the map there, right down okay, at the bottom. Look at that. Um, can't see us. Is, it is Hi. the <laughs> only region, really, in all of New Zealand that hasn't got a massive coastal influence. You know, you look at all the other wine-growing regions, all the way up to Northland, you look at Marlborough, Martinborough, Canterbury, they're all relatively coastal. Yeah. Otago is the one that kind of sits down there. Um, hugely, hugely famous for its Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're down near Queenstown, but Bannockburn is, you know, massive, great Pinot Noirs. And this particular winery, um, Wild Earth is right on the end of the Felton Road in Bannockburn, which is some of the best growing in all of New Zealand, yeah, let alone sure. just in the central Otago region. So Riesling, this is a grape we normally associate, obviously, with Germany. Now, I say obviously, it might not be obvious, but you know, you, if you if you were into your wines in the 1970s, I appreciate a lot of you weren't born then. Um, I definitely wasn't. Uh, that's not true. I was just about born in the seventies, and um, but you'll have heard of German Riesling, and and German Riesling is a wonderful thing. Um, this is quite a different style to the one that you might have heard of, isn't it? It's 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 quite a different. It's not like that really quite sort of semi dry. Absolutely, Riesling is one of these grapes that does so many different things. It can be from absolutely bone dry to really really sickly sweet and everywhere in between it yeah. can be drunk when it's very very young and very very fresh or it can be aged for a really long been lucky enough to drink some reason back 30 40 years oh, yeah. and they're still yeah. absolutely amazing but then you drink current vintage and great acidity great freshness and there's everywhere in between and you know i say to people like people go oh if you can only drink one grape ever again <laughs> <laughs> For me, it would be Riesling because it's got such variation, such style depending where it is. And this being on the South Island and being, you know, kind of inland, it's got this nice richness about it. It's got this honeysuckle, it's got this great freshness. And Wild Earth, relatively kind of strange when you say, talk about ageing of like a vineyard, because it depends where you are in the world. So, you know, New Zealand, and we'll talk a little bit about it in the... Um, in the video we're going to, you know, mm -hmm. New Zealand's been around for a while, but really kind of got into global winemaking in, you know, the early 90s. So these guys have been around since 1998. So relatively 
old school. Yep. But if you said in France, some, someone so had been around since 1998, it's like, uh, no, <laughs> not really. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. But what we're going to do is we're going to go to a quick video to give a little bit of a, a, a run round of, oh, I like that tasting right there, like a German cabinet. German yes, it's cabinet. got that dry, yes, crisp, fresh yeah. style. Absolutely. Mineral as well. So, yeah, um, it's that balance. Isn't completely it? Agree. But yeah. we're going to go to a little video just to kind of talk a little bit about New Zealand, a little bit about the... Um, about the regions and Alex in his Lord of the Rings style has decided to make it maybe just a little bit hobbity, but put your questions in the chat, tasting notes, keep <coughs> going with it. Cause the more you ask us, the more it becomes your show. Uh, it's an interesting fact actually about the, the uh, so we talk about the Hobbit locations in this video and for, for anyone who has been with us for more than, congratulations, uh, you, you'll remember a few bits of this. It's not the whole things that we've done before, but, um, New Zealand obviously was very famously where they filmed the Lord of the Rings series, but the new Amazon Prime series was filmed here in Britain. And I think at last part was filmed in Northern Ireland as well. So do we need um, to do a Wines we, of England We probably should do Great Wines Britain of, yeah, Northern Ireland. With Hobbits. And, yeah, with Hobbits. No, but anyway, be before he goes over the top with his Hobbit life, let's yeah. uh, get to the video. Let's get to the video and we'll see you in a couple of minutes, right? Bye for now. New Zealand. With its islands stretching around a thousand miles from north to south, it's home to some of the most dramatic landscapes in the world. From gentle rolling hills and stunning coastlines, through to misty valleys, rainforests, all the way up to towering mountains and majestic glaciers. And of course, it's the unmistakable backdrop to the Lord of the Rings series of films. I mean, just look at it, it really is quite something. If you've been following along with our previous tastings, you'll probably have a good idea what I'm about to say. That this variety leads to tiny pockets of land with an incredible range of different climates, which in turn leads to totally different growing conditions, suitable for a huge variety of different plants. So, when it comes to grapes and wine, why do we only ever think of New Zealand and Sauvignon Blanc? In comparison, Italy is around the same size, but has more than 500 different grape varieties used regularly to make wine. We got in touch with New Zealand wines, and we've been working closely with them to go deep into the history of the country, and more importantly, to find out what's happening today. Now, you might think that compared to other countries we've talked about, New Zealand's wine history might be a rather short piece. It's only really since the 1990s that today's common grape varieties like Sauvignon really became popular. However, it was 200 years ago that one of the early missionaries, Samuel Marston, made a forecast. New Zealand promises to be very favourable to the vine. Accordingly, many of the early colonists brought vine cuttings over, becoming quite a common sight in their gardens. The first written record of grapes being grown was in 1880. And in 1840, a French explorer called Dumont d'Orville wrote down that he had enjoyed a light, delicious, sparkling white wine on arrival. Throughout the 19th century, the industry struggled with the same problems that blighted much of the world. Mildew, phylloxera, and religious zealotry. The dreams of the fledgling industry were fading fast. Things recovered slightly in the 1920s and 30s. And the Second World War was actually good for business. With global supplies struggling and high tariffs, the local industry started to boom. The 60s and 70s brought a huge influx of investment from foreign countries who had started to see the potential. To give you an overview of the winemaking regions of New Zealand, I'm going to give you a bit of the tour of the country, but to make it more interesting, I'll be using the set locations from Lord of the Rings. Up in the northernmost parts of the country, there are some small pockets around Northland or Hobbiton making Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. Around Auckland and Waikato, just to the east of Mordor, you'll find Cabernet Sauvignon, Bordeaux blends, and some more Chardonnay. Just south of Mordor, Gisborne, is where you'll find Chardonnay and Pinot Gris, and then we're on to Hawke's Bay, where, in addition to all the varieties grown further north, we'll start to see some Sauvignon Blanc and some Syrah. Wairapa, on the southernmost tip of the island, that's Rivendell and Helm's Deep, brings Pinot Noir into the mix. We then make the jump across to the South Island, to Marlborough, the modern day home of Sauvignon Blanc, but also making some interesting Riesling and Pinot Noir. We then move west to Nelson, a small hop but a completely different climate, Dimril Dale in Lord of the Rings in fact. 
Going south, we really start to see Pinot Noir starting to dominate, first in the Waipara Valley near Christchurch, Edoras in Lord of the Rings, then down to the incredible variety of landscapes, rivers and beautiful lakes in Otago. In the films, this area on the South Island was used for more than six different locations, including the Golden Plains and the Dead Marshes. I told you it was quite varied. Right, that's quite enough hobbity nonsense. At least we've got that out our system. Let's talk about grapes. Now, many of the fans of the wine scene had come from Central Europe, such as Austria, and they had planted what they knew and loved, and went for reliable, trustworthy grapes that would produce a lot, if not perhaps the best quality. Things like Müller Thurgau. While popular locally, it was of course the shift of grapes such as Chardonnay and yes, Sauvignon that took the wines all around the world. Suddenly, a lot of the old vineyards had to be replanted, but this would mean that they would need to go three years or longer without generating any new income. Unable to cope with that, many of the local growers innovated and did something rather clever. Excuse me for geeking out for a moment, but this is called chip budding, and it's a technique where pretty much all of the old vine is cut away, and a single tiny bud from a Sauvignon Blanc vine is grafted onto it. Now, everything new to grow comes out of that one bud. So despite all of the roots and the trunk, you end up with Sauvignon shoots, leaves, and of course, grapes. The old vine is just reduced to being a pipe that carries up water and nutrients from the soil. The clever thing is that this process only takes your vineyard of action for one year, not three or four. Clever stuff. Well, welcome back. Um, I hope our little uh, inroads into a bit of uh, horticulture there didn't give you uh, too many uh, things, but it's genuinely quite clever. So y y we all think that a, a tree or a plant is just one big living thing, but the outside bit, the, the kind of bark, dead, absolutely dead, and the middle bit, dead, and there's only this tiny thin layer that's just sort of growing around the outside, which is actually carrying the life up right up until you get to the shoots. And um, and you can just plant this tiny little chip into it. That it, it, it it's just it's going to get all of the nutrition that it needs, all of the water it needs, and um, and that that turns into a completely different plant. I mean, you can actually do it, and there are people who do it with um, apple trees, where you end up with apples and pears growing on the same tree. So it's it's it, well, if you can do something as vastly different as an apple and a pear, you can certainly do. It to turn Muller Tourgau into, uh, into Sauvignon Blanc. So it was a big part of New Zealand's kind of ability to innovate quickly, and it was a really, really cool story, so I thought it's worth mentioning. Absolutely. But this isn't Sauvignon Blanc, this is Riesling. This is Riesling, so we can pull up, pull up the station notes quickly. And there was a, yeah. there was a cu couple of points that came up in the chat, re residual sugar and the fact that it feels much lighter. So, yes, there is some residual sugar in there. There's about 10 grams of residual sugar in there, which mm -hmm. sounds like... A big amount of sugar, yeah. um, but bear in mind a drier style of champagne like a brut can be about six or seven grams of sugar. Yeah. Um, you see a lot of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc yeah, classes. How much for a prosecco? They're even, even yeah, more even higher. Than that for but extra you know, dry. some of these dry dry style Sauvignon Blancs from Marlborough about yeah. eight ten grams. Yeah. So it's not a massive massive amount of sugar. And then the second point that comes with that is it feels much lighter than twelve and a half percent. And this is all about balance in the wine. Yeah. Because you can have high alcohol, but if that gets balanced with good fruit, mm -hmm. good integration, nice acidity, it feels less so. You know, when we talk yeah. about, you know, big red wines with high alcohol, when they, you know, you have some of these reds at 15, 16%, some of them can be yeah. absolutely just feel, you feel the heat, you feel the burn yeah, as it goes. Sure, yeah. And then you get the ones that are well made, like balanced tannin integration, good use of oak, nice red fruit to it. And then they go, you go, wow that doesn't feel like 15.5% or whatever yeah. it is. So it's all about balance and integration. And I think these guys do a really good job of this. You know, beautiful freshness, lovely, you know, there's lovely richness of flavour. It's not a wishy-washy no, kind no. of Riesling. Um, and, you know, you look at the tasting notes. There's, mm -hmm. so there's some bold flavours in there. You know, the yeah, honey, sure. the melon, the apple, the lime, it's, it's a fairly complex wine, just as you look through the um, look through the tasting notes. And, and I think it'd be a brilliant pairing to something like an Asian food, where particularly if you've got a bit of spice to it, the spice exaggerates some of those feelings of the the, 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 the alcohol and everything. So, so with a bit it's of spice, a, really nice... a bit of fattiness, um, yeah. like I said, as you cut through, surprisingly drinkable. 
Absolutely, and the acidity balance. This this is a wine. If you want to talk about how balance between lots of different things come together, mm. there is acidity. There is alcohol. There's big fruit. There's minerality. There's there's. It's a very complex wine, but it all comes together. I, and think, it's I think one per, that, perhaps I'd agree with the overall sort of like feeling that it it is at that lighter sort of end of it. But um, but 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 you're you're right about the balance. But I think it's one of those ones where when you put it into the context of the food suddenly it would just feel so right and something that was a bit more overpowering um, might you know, just dominate over the food. So if you're going for something with really subtle flavours that, uh, you know, things like a bit of sushi or, or something, this is always such a classic pairing mm. Riesling. But, but yeah, I think, I, think, I think it's a very nice one. And um, yeah, Cathy is pointing out that the, there is that l slight sweetness but the acidity just cuts through it so it is still so refreshing. Something that didn't have that acidity and had, you know, eight to ten grams of sugar in it would it. just be cloying it and flabby be, and you'll yeah pretty unpleasant yeah, actually yeah. Yeah. not great <laughs> so, so so yeah i i like it i i, I think so fantastic um, fantastic should we move on to the on to the next wine why not sounds so, like a good obviously, idea with all these things if you're if you haven't finished you can put it to one side you can come back to it or down it you can <laughs> We're supposed to be encouraging responsible drinking here, aren't we? I, think. I am, Wasn't but I'm also encouraging, encouraging responsible washing up. Responsible you don't want to use too many glasses. No, no, I'm on one glass, you're, now, you're now on your second glass, you see? Um, this is a problem. Yeah, I am on my second glass. And um, I'm looking forward to this, because I love Pinot Gris. I think it's a really, really cool grape. And I shall move the tasting notes on. So we are heading on. So wine number two is Kim Crawford. I think Kim Crawford is maybe a brand that... Lots of people will know of, will have heard of, because really were pioneers in getting New Zealand wines on the map, and very famous for their Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc is what they were all about. Yeah. Um, but now they make all different things. They do normal Sauvignon Blanc, they make Pinot, yeah. they make a sparkling, and they make this Pinot Gris. Um, Which isn't entirely Pinot Gris, is it? It's not entirely Pinot Gris, but we'll get to that we momentarily. But I think I think one of the one of the really interesting things you'll find with the story of the, a lot of the wines tonight is that we've got two Rieslings. We've got a Pinot Noir, or as it's known in Germany and Austria, you know, a a a, a uh, oh my God, what's it? Spat uh, Burgunder. Spat Burgunder. Yes, indeed. Sorry, I was, I was getting my Spat and Frau Burgunders confused for a second there. Um, That's Burgunder And we've got a we've got a Pinot Gris, a Grau Burgunder, crossed with a Gewürztraminer. Um, these are all, there's quite a lot of German and Austrian influence in the wines oh, absolutely. Of, of New Zealand. And, and that is all part of that story of those early people who came over and um, well, the mo skills. Most, most, most of Marlborough at the beginning was planted to Grunewald until they yeah. went about and did this, this chip budding thing where they were putting, yeah, the, uh, yeah, putting the grafting in. Um, but yeah, so this is 98% Pinot Gris and 2% yeah. Gewürztraminer. And blending is an interesting thing because... Yeah. You, you'd think, why bother putting 2% of yeah. anything? Well, are you going to taste it? You know? What does that achieve? Um, obviously, Pinot Gris is the same as Pinot Grigio, and not all created equal, you know. And if I make a broad generalisation, when we talk about Pinot Grigio, we're generally talking, you know, Italian, fresh, fruity, easy drinking. When we say Pinot Gris, we're generally talking more about that Alsatian style, that little bit more weightiness, that little bit of heaviness on the palate, that yep. texture and that style. You know, there are... Oh, Italian yeah. Pinot Grigios that do it the other way, there's, you know, Alsace that's very bright and fresh. So, you know, I don't need to go, oh, I had this one Italian, there's amazing Pinot Grigios all over the world or Pinot Gris. But when you see it in other parts mm. of the world, if it says Gris, it's probably looking for this more weighty style. Yep. If it says Grigio, it's probably going to be this more light, fresh kind of um, So this has this weightiness of an it Alsatian does, yeah. thing. And just the... Uh, the little bit of Gewürztraminer, and you know from a mile off, because Gewürztraminer is, you know, such a powerful, powerful grape. Very good. That, Very you know, good. the floral, um, the floral, yes. the lavender, those kind of like dried flower, that perfumey. You know, for me, Gewürztraminer, when it's done over the top, it's very potpourri-esque. Yeah. And I use it's the like whole... Being at your granny's house. Yeah, it's being, it's being in the... your grandmother's downstairs toilet. <laughs> it's just, it, it's just that over-the-top powerful dry fruit but adding just a little bit of it here Touch gives this beautiful it. kind of like yeah, Turkish delight I think that's probably a great tasting note for that yeah. bit of Gewürztraminer in there but it is it's pear it's floral it's honeysuckle it's got this richness about it mm. um, 
And the kind of the tropical fruits that come in, like your light cheese as well. I think mm. it's a really, um, a really clear thing that you're getting through there. But but absolutely so a little bit of that sort of that good ripe fruits, a little bit of the sensation of sweetness, but not necessarily with any of the sh much of the sugar of sweetness. But um, yeah, check that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, tiny little bit of sugar in there. It's three, three, three grams. Three grams. So it's nothing. you know probably just close to, as close to undetectable as you yeah. get with having without having zero sugar in there. So it's all coming um, from the ripeness of that fruit. So I mean, so that's a, that's a really cool thing. Now, this is Marlborough, and Marlborough does it turns out grow something other than just uh, Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, what I don't know. I think it'd be really interesting. So. I've always wondered, why is Marlborough and Sauvignon Blanc so linked? Is it because of companies like Cloudy Bay who made it so, so, so famous? Or is there something special about that region? So the, there is, I think, absolutely the commercial aspect. Yeah. The, it gets tied, you know, Marlborough, New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc, I think isn't much different to Argentina, Mendoza, Malbec. Malbec yeah. yeah. Or Burgundy uh, and Chardonnay. Or exactly. Exactly. But I really think for, for me for me going through the wine industry, when I when I first got into wine, you went into a pub and you ordered a pub, you ordered a dry or a medium dry and that was it. Yeah. And then a, a glass of white. Exactly. <laughs> and then and then white. slowly we kind of saw this thing that people knew what grape they wanted, whether it was a you know or a style, a peace port or a hock or something like yeah. that. Then it got into grapes that people wanted a Pinot Grigio or a Muscadet mm. or whatever that was. And I think the first one that I saw um, that became its own thing was people asking, you know, well, they'd ask for a Chablis, they asked for a Sancerre. But I don't think a huge amount of people knew that no. Sancerre or, or was or Sauvignon or, Blanc yeah. or whatever. So there was a yeah. generic region. But Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc was one of the first things that people came in and asked for a grape from a specific yeah. place. That's a fair and it became yeah. really cool. It was very well marketed by, you know, the, the Kim Crawfords, the Cloudy Bay, those kind of people, very mm. well marketed. And... It made money, so why would you yeah. change it? Yeah, um, but it, but it is a cool region as well. It, it's got lots of variation, hasn't it? I mean, it's 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 obviously at the north end of the South Island, and just a little bit over from Nelson, which is where we're going um, a little bit later. Yeah. Tasting, um, but but you're, you're now seeing, yeah. you know, it's it's dividing into different regions. Yeah. You're seeing subregions. They're trying to have, you know, within Marlborough its own kind of little mm -hmm. special pockets. Which, as we see that develop, you know, there'll be different styles of mold, which allows people to go, well, Sauvignon Blanc does really well, but there's this one little pocket here that Pinot Gris does really well, or yeah. Pinot Noir does really well, and we can see those things start to get differentiated, which I think is really important, because it's a big area. Mm. Um, you know, and, you know, you look at Kim Crawford, they won, I think it was in 2016, they won New World Winery of the Year from the Wine and Spirits magazine in, in the States. So of all the all the wineries of Australia, America, South, South America, America, all that kind yeah. of stuff, wow. these were the people. So it's, it's not very skillful. It's wine. not just about, you know, you hear about some of these bigger producers pumping out loads of mass produce and it all tastes yeah. the same. And sometimes New Zealand does get tarred with that brush for their Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc that you well, could line up you could line time. up fifty of them and they'd all taste the same. Yeah. But Sauvignon, and I'm, we shouldn't be talking about Sauvignon Blanc because that's next. But Sauvignon Blanc <laughs> has its own, it's, it's such a chameleon grape that adapts to where mm -hmm. it's grown, I think more than any other grape that's kind of, you know, yeah, a yeah. big named grape. But, I mean, this is, the, I, the more I drink this, the more I like it, the, the more things that are coming through. And I think, again, there are some, there is the weightiness and you've got that sensation of a slightly bigger wine, but there are lots of really quite subtle flavours and I not, don't necessarily always get those, you know. I'm not the greatest wine taster in the world, so I'll never pretend to be. But I do like the fact that you've got some slightly more savoury notes, you've got some floral notes, you've got some spicy things coming into it, and that is the sign of a, a well-crafted wine, something that can go with quite a lot of interesting foods again. And, um, uh, and not with those subtle, really subtle fish flavours that we would be talking about with the previous one. No, the Gouvertz has a little bit more power, so, so you know, like a pork dish or something like that, mm. you know, would go really with pork apple sauce, it's got that kind of, that fruit, because you, you need that yeah. little bit of richness and that little bit of fattiness again, but I just, I think this is just a, a delicious glass of wine and, yeah. you know, not something that, A, I would generally just go, I'm going to grab this, um, but also, you know, without, you know, it doesn't say on the bottle, it's got the Gewürztraminer, so if you didn't know that, you might get a little bit of a surprise, expecting yeah, it to yeah, be Pinot true. Gris, so yeah, it's, it's a <clears> kind of thing. 
And you know, I think there's a note in there that there is a slightly bitter aftertaste. There absolutely is, and I think that would work. That's why I'm saying it would work really nicely with food. Mm. So if you've got wine, when you taste it on its own, it feels a bit bitter or it feels a bit tannic. Again, that's where you, you've got to break out the food, and the food the food changes your interpretation. Well, as, as, as to Martin's point, Martin, yeah. you need to get yourself a bottle ordered. Imagine how good it would be <laughs> at the end of a bottle if the more it drinks or a case. This is even. true. This is true. Right. There we go. Yeah, it's, it's cracking wine. That I love it. Um, really nice. Hmm, interesting. So, um, so we've 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 done two quite different wines here, um, very different styles, both um, you know from the the southern island of New Zealand. Um, and we we talked in the video about how many of the the regions there are sort of up at the top. I think it, what's quite funny is we're going progressively north with these wines, aren't we? And uh, oh, we're heading well, into Martin Road. Then, then, then we're then we're coming back. Don't we're worry about that. Then we're going we back. And then we're going yeah. back. We, we're, yeah, it wouldn't be the most. Um, Best way to save petrol on this this journey. No, no, so you, could, you could do it more um, efficiently. Well, this is, so Sam Sam is enjoying the riesling the more he drinks of it, and I, I'll, I'll go back to that. I'll have a try again. <laughs> well done. Why not? I've got it. Well done. Thanks for saving that. But anyway, well, Alex uh, jumps in between wines, so he can remember where he is. We'll get we'll get <laughs> on to wine number three. Where we isn't get... it amazing how having two different wines in a different order can change your perspective so much. Um, and I, uh, I'm going to quickly mention, because I had a slightly strange experience in a restaurant where um, um, we had, uh, um, the sommelier came out and um, uh, there was one course that we had got for a starter and um, they recommended a, an Australian Grenache, a big fruity red wine. And then for the next course, the main course, they recommended a very light Italian white wine. And on their own, those pairings were really good spectacular but to have one and then the other to have to go from a heavy red to a light white was not right at all so so yeah doesn't that, that just again it tells you it's just not right oh the, the chat's been hacked again yeah well it's not it's just people commenting on youtube not much you can do about that so ignore 69 mega.com and i'm going to ban them hey excellent they're gone so sorry about that um <laughs> um find have, find, have a good time and find your love, though. I, I've got to say, that's actually quite a good description of what we're doing tonight, isn't it? We're finding the wines that we love. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think that's, that's the way to do it. Fair enough. The joys right. of YouTube. So we're going to Sauvignon Blanc. Of course we are. We can't go to New Zealand without, without doing it. But at least we, we dodged Marlborough and we're going for Martinborough. It's a bit more famous for its Pinot Noir, isn't it? Absolutely. So we're... Well, on the very southern tip of the North Island, New Zealand is a lot of it's the north of the South Island or the south of the North Island. Or where, where am I? And it can, you know, trying to remember where you are after drinking all of these wines. You've got to know where you are. Um, but this is Atarangi. And um, Atarangi means dawn, sky, new beginning. It does, yes. Isn't that nice? Yes, isn't, isn't that nice? That's nice? yeah. um, quite a well-known brand, but, but, but it, it's... Uh, it's yeah, it's it's got a good message there in the native uh, uh, languages of um, our 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 terrain, isn't it? Well, I've probably pronounced that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. But I think there's a, there's a point up there um, about it tastes very different from your typical New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, and I completely agree. Mm. If your typical New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is Marlborough, yes. Um, and I'm oh, gonna, I'm going to go. Wow. We go off piste a little bit here um, and go back to our, a South African tasting we did. And I, I was talking to the winemaker at Jordan. Yeah, uh, great aroma. Um, I was talking to the winemaker at Jordan, and I said, "So you know, how how do you feel like a, a South African Sauvignon Blanc compares to a Sancerre or a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc?" And he, he looked at me and goes, "Well, which one?" It depends where it's from because yes. South Africa is massive, yeah. and if you have something coastal, your Sauvignon Blanc is very oh, different to whether you're you're inland. Um, and you know, if you go to you go to France, your Sauvignon Blanc from Sancerre is vastly different to Puy Fumé. It's vastly different to a Sauvignon Blanc being made as yeah. a, as a Bordeaux Blanc. Um, and I think that's what we've got to to realise with New Zealand. I think we're very very accustomed to seeing these Marlborough styles, which are that gooseberry, yeah. grapefruity, bright acid. But then if we go to other places, we should almost expect them to be a different style. And I think this is classically what you should expect yeah. from Martinborough. It's got a little bit more richness, a little bit more of that grassiness about it. And um, yeast. 
yeah, there's a lot of texture that's come from a bit of contact with the yeast. But I suspect, and I, I, I don't know, I haven't got the details in front of me because the, this goes too deep into the winemaking stuff. But a lot of the, 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 the Sauvignon Blancs from, from Marlborough, they did research into which different varieties of yeast to use, just like you do with beer, just like you do with bread, and what, what kind of yeast should be used to ferment this. And they went for ones that, they, um, that would develop certain characteristics and um the you know the the lychee the the the, the gooseberry flavors that you get I, I i i'd be intrigued i think this is not going to be doing the same yeast i think this is going to be doing something quite different so this also why it's different is they ferment some of this on the skins as well so they have a little bit of skin <clears throat> contact in here that gives that richness they do a little bit of oak um there is a uh, there is a comment there Oak and Sauvignon Blanc, yuck. And <laughs> yeah. that is... Controversial, for sure. Controversial, well, not but, but, even, but, not, but some of the best I ones. Wouldn't say, <laughs> I wouldn't say controversial. It's, well, it's controversial these days. Choice, it's, not, it's not the modern it's technique choice, of doing It's it. choice and style. Yeah. Um, but some of the best Sauvignon Blancs in the world, Puy Fume, for example, yep. is an oaked Sauvignon sure. Blanc. A lot of them are in oak. Bordeaux ones. Absolutely, yeah. but I think when you once again when you have that ex the expectation of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, yeah. you're having this, this expectation of yeah. stainless steel, fresh, bright, high acid, crisp, fresh, mm. delightfulness. This definitely has a little bit more texture. With de so yeah, um, as Sam's put in there, like an orange wine, it's that same thing, but it's only about. 10% of it on the skins rather than all of it on the skins. And yeah, so and as uh, on there, has it had oak? It's a yes. blend. It's some oak, Sorry. some stainless steel. So you get that little bit. So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of winemaker techniques going on in there mm. that we've got some, some skin contact. We've got some whole bunch. Yeah. You love a bit of whole oh, bunch. Okay, so uh, awesome. We've got some oak. We've got some stainless steel. So this is why we've got this level of complexity. And you, you just so look... Whole, hang on. Whole bunch fermented... Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's that's a new one. I've often wondered about that. So th this is this is a technique that's used for this making is also, This is also discoverous. I know. <laughs> but like, normally, what you do to make a white wine, you crush the grapes and you press press the juice out, and it what comes up with that? this juice, and uh, and you put your yeast in if you're going to put yeast in, and then it turns into wine. With this, they put the whole grapes in. That, that is a technique that's not for wine. In fact, I've not come across that. Oh, that's perhaps my, you know. Uh, limited sort of uh wine making wake, wine. times well yeah but but it's something i'd always wondered what would happen and um so yeah five percent of it done a whole bunch interesting but i think kind of cool you, you look at the word cloud and see how busy that is mm. shows how much there is going yeah. on in this one it's a completely different set of flavors to the other stuff the stuff that's been um done on the skins gets all sorts of flavours from the skins. That's the more kind of grippier side of things, the more the, the stronger flavours, the more sort of bitter flavours that come into it. So yeah, it is it is different. You've got you've got a bit of earthiness to it. You've got a bit of bitterness to it. Someone's just pointed out there I've seen and greenness again all particularly probably if the stems were in there, that would give a bit of the greenness for that. So Yeah, I I think it's yeah. a cool one. I think this is probably gonna be a marmite. It's a geeky wine, isn't it's it? It's a geeky it's wine a and it's a marmite <laughs> wine and I think you know if we put a poll up now which we're not going to because we've not set up we're that, not, no. we go love it hate it or i'm kind of in the middle yeah i don't think we'd have many in the middle i think we'd have people go this is just my kind of thing or oh, this yeah. isn't quite for me um yeah and do you know what? but would love, we're, but would love, we'd love to know love to know your opinions in the yeah, chat we, if we, it's your kind of thing or not and this is the like we we've not made these wines we've selected these yeah. wines because we think they're cool we think no, they're well made us. they're right but it's about <laughs> your opinion and that's what makes it fun yeah and it's great when people disagree with each other because that means we've done something which is just, isn't just straight down the middle and um uh, and rebecca loves it i i i i, I really love this one as well I, i've got to be honest I, and i i'm one of the first to say when i don't think something's particularly my bag but Amy doesn't like it, and that's cool. So, so if you're going out to go for a nice Sauvignon Blanc that's up your street, don't go for this one. Go for one of the other ones. Go for, go for a, a cloudy bay, or you know. But but I think that's interesting that when you do, oh, we do. <laughs> you're not al always one. We're not allowed to be in the middle. That was my whole point. It's yeah. all over. Um, oh, <laughs> but but I think this is a thing that you know when you go when you then go out to I a restaurant. Don't mind or, either. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you go out to a restaurant or, you know, a wine shop, you can say, this is the style of Sauvignon Blanc that I do like or I don't yeah. like. Uh, you know, I had this one from Martin with skin contact. Love that. Or I absolutely never want to see that again. And then you don't get caught up with that. Um, food pairings with this... Um, I, I no. On that. Um, yeah. I think I might, I might, I might say it was like a Bordeaux white. So obviously with some soap, but I'd say there was something else in there to give it a bit more. Yeah, bit. that texture. Yeah. Um, uh, so what would we pair with this one? Oh, it's got to have something richness. I think this is like getting into like sort of you know your roasted chicken and kind of things like that. Oh, you can't do that. You've, I was just about to say roast chicken dinner. Aye, so, so exactly. So this kind of roast chicken dinner where you've got that kind of like soft white meat, that little bit of yep. fattiness, that kind of richness. Um, that you know you've got that kind of yeasty bready kind of thing. Um, something you know if you're seeing mm. something like salmon on croute would be good with the pastry. Yeah, that would be nice. You know yeah. if you've got something that's got that bready start you need that bready starchiness somewhere in, yeah. in the dish to go with that kind of like yeastiness in there that's got the acidity to cut through it does still have the acidity in there that's that backbone to mm. it so so that's nice yeah absolutely fun. absolutely fun so where are we going to go next we're gonna go to Argen argentina <laughs> um so we, for those who have been joining us for a little while, um, we've had some updates backwards and forwards with our friends at Al Passion Vineyards. Um, you know, we've met the winemaker, we've seen what they're going on, and we've got a little video this month, just a little update and a little kind of recap of who they are, where they've been, what they've been doing. So finish up wine number three, get wine number four in the glass. And any of the other ones you've still got to yeah. drink, yeah. Let's catch up with Al Passion. And then we'll come back and get back to New Zealand yeah. and wine number so, four. So for those of you who don't know, this is a, a, a one of our friends who, uh, it's Kathy actually in the chat, um, has a winery that she started with a whole bunch of her friends over in Argentina in the Uco Valley. And um, they make some really cool wines and they've been very kind enough to share their story with us. So here comes a little clip of what they've been up to. And we'll see you in a sec.
Um, well done to you guys. Uh, it's a really cool project. Just, just so you know, there's been no monetary exchange for this. It's just uh, we love the story and we love the fact. Great that wines, it's fun. It's great good wines, people. Cool people, and we'll wines. be. Doing a fair few of those wines over the next year. I think year. we will. I think we, we will. absolutely will. Yeah, and, but, and obviously we've got to come and visit. As well, exactly, it's the only Although we, way. We've got, to, no. we've got to have a dibs on the hot tub in the glumping pods. That sounds pretty. pretty I think fun. that's great. So, but uh, so anyway, <laughs> hey, back. Hey, Kathy's saying that they all looked so um, so much younger in two thousand and nine. We looked so much younger in two thousand and twenty. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> don't don't look, don't look at our old shows. We were young whippersnappers back then. Indeed, exactly. Indeed. But anyway, let's uh, let's, yeah, let's move on. Let's move, on. let's move the tasting notes on. Let's get the wine in the glass. Zweigelt. So go from there. Um, oh, there we go. Well, if we're we're actually going out to um, uh, to California in January, so so yeah, February. Should we pop down to uh, Uko? That could be worth a trip. Yeah, that sounds yeah. good. You know. Two, two years tied up going nowhere and then California and Argentina in a matter of months. That'd be ideal. But anyway, do you want to pop the tasting notes on so everyone can continue with that? That would be yes, a wonderful good. idea. Okay, so okay. we're on to wine number four. And um, uh, Seyfried, so one of the absolutely sort of um, pioneering families of uh, South Africa. They New Zealand. Sorry, New Zealand. Sorry, I've, oh, I'm here to, here to you help. Know, I've been I've been blind tasting Jamie as I, I I do because I've got to keep him getting ready to become one day a master sommelier. And, um, <laughs> I'm he's laughing. Joke. The master sommelier is probably the hardest exam in the world. It's 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 uh, it's super ridiculous. Anyway, um, and I've been doing him with this whole series of South African wines. So I've got South African on my mind. But um, uh, but yes. Um, so we're we're taking an Austrian winemaker and an Austrian family, and an Austrian grape, and we're going over to, to Nelson, which is just west, northwest of uh, Marlborough. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, should we pull the, pull the map up again? Absolutely. Well, you can pull the map oh, up. Okay. You can pull the map up, so yeah, we can see where our Nelson there, and then we've got a little map actually, of... Just, just due west, actually. Yeah, about about 40 right. kilometres. Yeah. 40 kilometres west. But what's but a totally different climate, isn't it? Absolutely. So the, these, these guys started... 1973, they came over from Austria to, to plant grapes and bought over... Austrian varietals, Gruner, Zweigel, Wurzer, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, but what is really, you know, interesting, unique about this area is we're we're facing the Tasman Bay. So you can see where Nelson is, um, kind yeah. of top halfway it's up, sort of right hand side. Yeah. So we've got that, but we are in the Brightwater Vineyard for the Zweigel, which is number seven on the map. So the Tasman Bay is your water, but then you can kind of you can't you can see where it's a little bit darker around the edge of the map. That's all mountains. That's the Richmond range of mountains. So it becomes sheltered. Mm -hmm. So you get that cooling yeah. influence from that influence from the sea, but it's then also sheltered from heavy winds and storms and all that kind yeah. of good stuff. You can, you can see how that 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 sort of line going from sort of the the south middle of the map up to the northeast. That's just all nice and flat and low, and you can just imagine the the sea mists and breezes just rolling in from that to keep the temperature all the same. Um, but yeah, it's so sheltered, super cool. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, Zweigel is if if Pinot Noir yeah. and Syrah had a baby and it was Austrian, it would be that kind of thing. I think you've got all these cool things that you get from Pinot Noir, but then you get this smokiness, this spice, whatever. And I think if we ever want to travel anywhere, I think we've got a little picture of the vineyard we can pop up. The, um, yeah. Which one's that? There? That, that is... Brightwater. Brightwater, yeah. We've got two of them, actually. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, so you're, you're about 15 kilometres from the sea, so you're far enough to be sheltered. And you can see these, these rows of vines here. They have a grand total of... 11 rows of Zweigelt, less, <laughs> less than a hectare. That's all there is there. That's all there is wow. there. And it's really cool to be able to get these kind of, uh, these kind of wines in this and on the tasting. This isn't a mass-made wine. I think that's the nicest Zweigelt I've ever had. I often find it's got a little bit of this kind of slightly sort of, um, um, I don't know, like blueberry kind of note to it that, that's, that sticks out a bit. But that's got, that's got, like a lot of sort of more developmental, like it's got, like it's, you can see the bit of age on it. Um, and it's, it, that's just mowed it. And it's, a, it's really lovely. It's nice. It's soft. It's got spice. It's got texture. Mm. It's chewy. Um, food wise, this is, I think you could have this slightly, slightly chilled. Yeah. With a charcuterie platter. Yeah. With that spice, salami, smokiness. Happy days. Cheese and wine, cheese and cheese and meat board with with this, I think, would be great. 
So, so um, we have we have a note that, that that it sucks the moisture from your tongue. So compared to the the white wines, obviously there's a lot more tannin, like you have in your tea, that you, you you'll find in this sort of wine. Um, it's not in the sort of the realms of the really super 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 tannic wines, like you know your your young Bordeaux's, your ones from you know Barolo and things like that. But it, it's definitely more more tannin than a Pinot Noir. Um, Absolutely, sure. and it's a it's a big jump from. <laughs> A barrel aged Sauvignon to this, so there's a first jump of tannins of the night is there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's a point about a quick overview of Vigel, and I kind of covered yeah. my thoughts on it. But what you generally have is you have this red cherry flavour, mm -hmm. so it's very very candied cherry, and then it kind of goes through into the mid palate. You get these darker fruits, mm. and then you get this savoury, smoky spice texture in the back end. Is generally what you find some are lighter some are heavier yeah. some have more focus on different bits aging wise it's you know it's not something that you want to hang on to for a hundred years you know over three five years it will develop absolutely but it's not going to go any further than that generally so it's it's designed to be drunk fairly young um you know there's going to obviously going to be certain people who make as well get designed for aging the same way that some pinot noirs are designed to be sure. young yeah. some are designed to do but your general, especially if you're going and drinking these Austrian, they're kind of that that table wine, drink it fruity, yeah. easygoing style with a little bit of texture. I had I had some really nice ones um, over the summer in Austria, um, I, but I, th I think this I think this is this is my favourite. It's just I think there's just so much more to it than just the fruit, and the the the, the, the so I got for me are often very very fruit dominant, and um, this has got such such a a sort of a breadth of different flavors into those kind of like the the, the nice the the spice the, the the vanilla things coming from the the oak barrels that it's aged in and um uh, uh yeah I, I really like mm. it but yeah across the board you know family winery great people they make you know they make the austrian grapes but they also make the clan they make the yeah. the um the seven year monks they make an absolutely and I shouldn't say this because we're doing a different one, but they make <laughs> they make an absolutely phenomenal um, sweet Riesling they, they, as well. Yes. So across the board, really good. So keep an eye out for these guys because, yeah, it's good wine. It's relatively small production and pretty good value for money for some more, you know, kind of like unique grape growing. Um, and that, that's 14% alcohol. But again, just to, just for me, it, it, it hides it. It hides, um, it hides the alcohol because the tannin matches it. And there are various things in wine that balance against each other. And so if you've got a really, really super light wine, it's got a really high alcohol, that will burn in your mouth. But if you've got the other things that sort of raise to do that, a bit but more it, But it, spe it spends a year in the barrel to allow it to kind of mm. mellow out and soften around with that slightly higher alcohol. If yeah. that came straight over, that was done in stainless steel, it would go, pfft, yeah. ow, painful. But having that year in barrel kind of... They say in their tasting notes... I get that. I do get that sort of that that like that kind of figgy pudding sort of thing going on. Um, if you look for that one, I definitely find that mocha flavours. I'm not sure I'm getting the mocha, but but yes, it's it's it, it it's all very much in balance. Now now Martin's going. The wines have got lots of complex flavours, but they're just not they're not. He's not getting the depth of them, the intensity perhaps of in each individual one. Mm. That's a, that's a fair point. It's not. I think to get really, really super powerful individual flavours, that's one of the ones where you, you really need to have heat. And, and also, no, none of these yeah. wines for me have a massively, massively long finish. They're all, you know, I think yeah. they're all pretty good drinking wines. Yeah. Um, you know, all of these wines, I would happily open a bottle, you know, open a bottle on a Tuesday night and drink it and yeah, go with it. Sure. Um, there's nothing on here so far that we've had that I would agree that would need decanting or a big glass or any of that kind of for stuff sure. that you're going to sit and go whoa that hangs out forever <laughs> and ever yeah. and ever and ever and that's not always the bad thing it's the yeah. right wine for the right time for the right person um you know yeah this this isn't a barolo this hasn't got you know oodles and oodles of length and long time it's bright it's great fresh and sometimes you know where you have these slightly cooler climates and you have this higher acidity that acidity sometimes will refresh your palate, so therefore you don't end up with that length of mm. length of flavour. You go, oh, that was bright and fresh, and, and it's gone. But in some ways, that rather than it lingering, it makes it moorish. That you go, oh, I want to have another sip. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good point, Martin. A very good point. Yeah, no, I know, I, I, and totally fair, totally fair. 
So, I mean, and that's that's the wonderful thing. So this this is a cooler part of, of the cooler island of the two islands. The further north you go, so anyone who's used to well, what we're normally talking about in the the northern hemisphere, the further south you go, the warmer it gets. Of course, where it's the opposite way around in the southern. Absolutely. So as you get up onto that, um, you know, into your uh, Hawkes Bay. Um, it's getting a bit warm, and then right up into sort of you know the north of the yeah. North Island. You get up to uh, Wahiki yeah. Island and Auckland. You can get some you know Cabernet Sauvignon yeah. and Syrahs up there that are big, right. fruity, tannic, yeah. really really good stuff. Cool. Do you but, think it's? Time? I think I like it. I think it's fun. I think it's a nice one. But yeah, let's move on to let's move on to wine number five, five. The Pinot Noir. So I, I'm intrigued by this because I we we were we were sort of a bit um and ah about which order to put these in because. A Pinot can be super light, but then this is from the hotter part of the country, so... You can all, you can all judge my... You can, uh, you can tell you, what we... You, you can all judge my selection process. Tell us what you think. As long as you're nice about it. Be nice, be, be yeah. nice. Be judge my selection process if you think I got it right. <laughs> that would be wonderful. So, Pinot Noir, we normally think about things like Syrah. And uh, yeah, eventually going into some of the cabin cabernets and things like that. And if you look at places which grow Syrah and those kind of slightly warmer grapes in France, if we translate it to the, sort of the France part of the world, that's the south of the country. Whereas they grow Pinot Noir up in the north in Burgundy. So I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. I haven't tasted this yet, so I'm going to give it a go. So, yeah, if, for those of you who have joined us many times previously, you'll know I'm, I'm a big fan of this, this winery and, you know, we did their Tempranillo last month, we've done their Syrah previously. Um, but I just think it's a cool story. Um, this winery became founded in 1993 in a restaurant in London, the Bleeding Heart restaurant, in <laughs> fact, um, when John Hancock took his, uh, took his wines over and um, took them into a restaurant and poured them and then they decided they'd find some space in Hawke's Bay and make it. They didn't go back and take over a winery. They went and built a winery from scratch yeah. in Hawke's Bay. And what is cool okay. about Hawke's Bay, it's, it is, you can't say absolutely unique because unique is the word, isn't it? <laughs> it is a unique place for growing grapes because you've got coastal, you've got these amazing gravelly soils called the Gimlet Gravels, and then you've got these steep slopes. So you've got coastal and slopes and gravel great drainage which yeah. means that the vines have to strive hard so you can get a light earth style wine that's hugely intense hugely power and i think they got you know for as martin said earlier the deep flavors that were missing this for a pinot noir yeah this is definitely deep, it does. deep jammy flavors um some of the yogurty things you get again from the the from the, 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 the malolactic fermentation. That's a geek word, sorry. We promise, no geek words. Uh, like basically, um, just the, one of the natural barrel aging processes. And um, Yeah, uh, uh, clone 667 and 777. Ah. Um, if you're worried. Okay, so, it's a cool wine. It's a cool wine, it's interesting. That's, that's not what I'd go for in a Pinot Noir, because what I like in a Pinot Noir is quite different. I think I've said this to you in the past, when you pulled out um, a, a really, really big American Noir, and I just like them a bit cooler than that. But, but it's cool. It's I, I think the reason I, it's not that I don't like it is that it's not it's not kind of very Pinot Noiry to me. It's it's got it's it's like they've turned the f the, the dial up on some of the flavours to to left and, and lost some of the subtlety of it. But it's, it's uh, yes, and high tannins as well for a Pinot Noir. Well said, absolutely. But again, you look that at the, is because... But, but if, you, if you've got a bit intensity. of white paper, you look at the intensity yeah. of colour and the extraction on that. That's, that's, that's bonkers. Now, alcohol helps extract colour and flavours from the skins of the grapes. So as it ferments and as the alcohol level increases from the sugars in the grape, it just draws those. It's, like it's a solvent, you know, like uh, you, you'd expect. So it's just drawing those colours and tannins out of the, the skin, uh, skins of the grapes. Um, they're, they're, they're not aggressive tannins, but they are plentiful tannins. But I think they're very well integrated. Yeah. They kind of, they round them out. You know they're there. They're chewy. Yeah. They're, they're there. Um, but I like, but I, I like my, I like my Santa Barbara. I like my big bold, yeah, Pinots, yeah. Um, Oregon's, and yeah. Hmm. I don't dislike it. It's just not what I go for. 
Um, it, it's not a just have a glass of Pinot Noir, Pinot no, Noir, is it? No, it's, it's, you've got to... And it's so fruit forward, it's not got that kind of the massive sort of balance of the thing. But could you could you age it? Well, I mean, the you're, you, you've, you've named the, a lot of the right things. So you, to age a wine, you need high acidity. Um, um, it helps preserve the wine so it doesn't go off. You need lots of bold fruit flavours that can turn to tertiary styles, yeah, which it has, and, and it's got tannins. and alcohol. And now, so yeah, alcohol, acidity, tannin, fruit. fruit. It's it, got it all. It I, should be able to age, shouldn't it? I think I think this could hang out for ten years quite happily. Yeah, quite happily. Um, I like it as it is because I like this big bold yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, I don't. And I, I, let me be clear. I don't dislike it at all. Um, it's just, it's just I tend to go for something slightly different in the Pinot Noirs. And that's just, that's the wonderful thing about this. This is just personal preferences. Um, Kathy has been to the Bleeding Heart restaurant uh, because it's very close to the Staple Inn. And you often order the Trinity Hall. That's nice that they're, they're still serving them there. That's, that's really cool. I like it. Um, so now, would it improve if you like age stars? Yes, very much so. Because those, those it has all the ingredients. Range. The only thing I'd, I'd question about is this, this is the screw cap, isn't it? Uh, yes. So, um, a screw cap wine, um, to... Do you want to put your picture back up? Oh, yeah, let's... Sorry. So oh, people can yeah. see what you're the doing. screw cap wine. So, screw caps are not all created equally, and that's not a bad thing. Um, just like pouches are not all created equally. Like, what we found when we were doing the development of our things is that, um, that none of the plastic pouches you see for your you know your kids fruit snacks and things like that had anything like the characteristics that need to cope with wine but some wines to age for 10 years need a little bit of oxygen to get in to help the aging process so i suspect that these being good scientific winemakers they will have chosen the lining of the uh, cap and yeah Inside the cap, you know, there's that little disc that you find. Little pad that little, sometimes little you pad. take the thing off and it's stuck on the and thing and you have to pop it, it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, those are probably made from five different layers of materials, and they are very, very carefully designed to have different rates that the oxygen can transfer into the bottle to allow it to age or to try to keep it as fresh as possible. So your your Sauvignon Blanc, you want to keep it as super, super, super fresh as possible, no oxygen. A wine with a bit of tannin, a red wine with a bit of tannin, a bit of uh, acidity, you might allow a little bit more in. So you, you can just choose a different uh, a different kind of um, cap for the different kinds of wine. So that's, that's, that's um, assuming they've done the right one, yes, it should improve beautifully. So yeah. But I've never been to the Bleeding Heart restaurant. Oh, let's look for another invite. We're, we're, we're relying <laughs> well, Mark, on... Mark's been there. We're, so, so. We're, we're, we're rely on Cathy to, to Argentina and the Bleeding Heart restaurant now, aren't we? <laughs> bit by bit. So, Cathy! Cathy! Hello! <laughs> what, you mean this fine wine advent okay, calendar? Okay, put that down. We'll do this at the end we'll of the tasting. We'll do that at the end. <laughs> so. No, nothing to it. <laughs> um... So yeah, Wine 5, um, a very different style of Pinot Noir. It might be right up your street, it might not be, but um, but it's certainly a very different style to the Burgundies and, and things like that. Um, Absolutely, and I think and that's the thing. Like the South American ones, like, you know, you're, we, we had a Casablanca Valley one, and uh, and that was just, it was very kind of, you know, Again, straight middle of the road mm. kind of thing, wasn't it? But it is each their own. I think that's the thing. You know, I talk about not making blanket statements. Not all Pinot Noirs are created the same. Not all Chardonnays oh. are created the same. And you, you find the ones that you like. So, anyway. Wine number six. Let's move on to wine number six. And this is back to St. Clair. <laughs> and we like St. Clair. Do you want to do that like one? We do like St. Clair. Uh, I'm going to point into that and then have that one. There you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There we go. That's fine. <laughs> this is what the sommelier of the year calls a fair pour. You know, you fair have to pour. do this thing where you split uh, a bottle of wine between thirty different glasses evenly. I think, I think, I think you nailed that there, mate. Anyway. Uh, exactly. So, <laughs> anyway, so we are at St Clair, and we love St Clair, and we are back in Marlborough. And this is that yes, we do indeed. So this is their noble riesling. So yeah. it's a Botrytis style riesling. So it's you know when we talk about Botrytis, that's the same thing that affects grapes that makes Sancerre, that gives it this lovely sweetness, this lovely nuttiness. It's mould. 
Well, you make it sound so delightful, don't you? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, St. Clair, Rim Marlborough, this is their 2018 vintage. Yeah. But rather than me talk too much, we'll let Hamish Clark, who's uh, the winemaker over there, <laughs> tell us all about it. See you in a sec. St. Clair Noble Riesling. This is a variety that we can't make every year, but when we do make it, or well, when the conditions are favourable for making a Botrytis style Riesling, um, we're able to capture the bright acidities that the maritime climate of Marlborough offers. Um, this, is, this is luscious, it's got um, beautiful acidity, and it's underpinned by the incredible flavours that come through from, uh, from the Riesling. Um, like I was saying before, can't make it every year, um, and it surprises me how quickly this stock um, does disappear out the door. If you find it on the shelf, buy a bottle because you might not be able to see it um, for the next season. An OWTC Christmas outing to the Bleeding Heart. That oh. sounds a fantastic oh, yes. idea. Fantastic After idea. After we've got all the advent calendars out of the way. <laughs> so yeah, so this for me is, it's quintessentially what dessert wine should be. It's rich, it's honeyed, it's got stickiness, but it's got acidity there. You know, the residual sugar in this, you're 155 grams a litre Yeah, that puts sugar. things into perspective, doesn't it? It's not, I mean, so when... Sorry to put you on the spot. Do you remember what Coca Cola is? And is that, that I want to say that's about 90 ish. About 90. So this is sweeter than Coke. <laughs> and so that's, that's pretty cool. But yeah, there's something about this process where they call it noble rot. And um, apologies for those who, who know this stuff. But um, it, it, it's, there are lots of different ways to, to, to make a dessert when you've got to concentrate the sugar. The, the sugar's got to get a lot higher than the normal grape. You're, you're trying to create some raisins and those kind of things. And um, you can either do that by trying to dry them out or by freezing them, whether it's you know in a freezer or, or on cold vine, ice wine, um, where the water stays behind. Or you can rely on a natural process called the noble rot. And the noble rot um, is where the mists roll in, in the morning and start it rotting you, you get you it encourages the growth of this 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 fungus called botrytis uh, definitely make gives it that characteristic color hannah you're absolutely right and um but to stop this growing off completely and becoming disgusting this is really important is that in the afternoon the sun has to come out and dry it all out and that is what makes a good noble wine and riesling is a great grape to make dessert yeah. wines from yeah. so yeah yeah you generally see you know this kind of style is either made with riesling or semillon or two yeah. made sometimes a bit of sauvignon blanc but generally for the uh mm. the, the noble cool. rot or botrytis wines that they get called sometimes um is that kind of stuff but this just kind of i think this just shows how oh. varied marlborough can be yeah. um the you know we have these high acid crisp dry fresh wines to these really kind of rich kind of styles and i think that's Really, really cool. Um, so, yeah, can we have a look yeah, at the tasting? Taste yeah. well. I love the bee. That's excellent. Bee. <laughs> and and weirdly I, Morris. Well, and like you said, you I've, know, I've, they, not, they... I've not eaten a lot of bees to know what bee tastes like. <laughs> um, a bit of a bite in the tail, but yeah, yeah. But there's honey, 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 and honey. Reasons. Apricot. But but again, the decision smells of glue. Bit, bit of glue sniffing. <laughs> um, Oh, well, we've got a revolting in there. Well, do you know, Which... remember that, um, you know, uh, this style of wine, uh, probably some of the most expensive wines in um, in France. So but also... Chateau de Chem is now partly owned by something called a Kim Kardashian, which I don't know what that is, but uh, I'm, 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 I have vaguely heard of that. Um, and... Um, uh, and 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 these wines can age for forever. Like the 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 they've got everything they need to preserve them. So this is this is twenty eighteen. So it's a relative young mm. young one. But it is another it is another style of wine yeah. that if you like your dry, fresh, crisp wines, <laughs> this, like is, this. this is this is not not, not for that. you. And I've seen a lot of people because I, I love dessert wine. I'm yeah. slightly obsessed, um, especially he dessert wine steak. made from riesling. Um, <laughs> but you hand this to someone who drinks Sancerre or mm. you know dry white wines 
And you had this other go, what the hell yeah. is that? Um, but in context, it's, it's a really cool wine. It just might not be the one for you. Uh, I, I, I like that a lot. I think that's a really fun wine. And the guys say, they, they, they go through a lot of it, but it's got the spice and this kind of, mm. the, just like you had with the reed, that weight, the coating your cut tongue. And, that um, sounds like a wonderful idea. That's good plan. Good well plan done. indeed. Yep, absolutely. Um, so do we? Don't, don't if you don't. So do we want to put the poll up for yeah, the wine of the night while that. while you do your advent calendar promo? Yeah, yeah my advent. It's not mine. We don't. We, it's not for us. But um, yes, uh, we've got. So let's have one last look at that. Um, Baklava. Excellent. Well, of course, I mean, that's is that you rob a bank? That's exactly what. Oh, that that's Baklava, exactly isn't it? Sorry. That is. Yes. That smells um, like your one. So what? Very quickly, <laughs> what do we pair this with? This for me, this is kind of you either baklava, baklava or <laughs> that would work. this is this is for me because it's so sweet. Like instead of dessert, I would just sit and drink this yeah. all alone because unless you get a dessert that's very very, it's got to be sweet. sweet this it could is good with your figgy pudding though. This it yeah, could. I think it's got to be a very dried, um, fruity esque. Like this yeah. is this isn't a Raisinated. chocolate kind of thing. It's got to be that yeah. yeah that kind of deep fruit stewed. Loads of sugar in it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm going to flick it through to you, the ones of the night, so you can vote for what you what you enjoyed and um, uh, what you think the, the your favourite ones were. Yeah. Um, yeah. As you might have noticed, we do have this little thing here. Um, so we we undeniably about whether we were going to make our own advent calendar, and um, uh, oh gosh, it, it's um, uh, we kind of thought actually you've got to do a good number of these things to make it worthwhile and um so we partnered up with Lathwaite who we you know for for those of you who don't know obviously we started off doing this we invented the packaging and now we do it for naked wines for Lathwaite for the wine society for a whole bunch of other things we've cool done. friends cool friends all of our friends and we, we're delighted to, to do it for them because it's 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 great to let people try wines um this uh, we have created with them, and there are some absolutely cool wines. Banging wines, really. And, so, and uh, classic the, wines. the list is available online, but yeah. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do spoilers. Yeah, but there is, there is Barolo, there is Chablis, yeah. there is Bordeaux, there is Sauterne, and you get yeah. 24 hundred mil pouches to get you through Christmas. So, there you go. so if you want one of these. Don't buy them from us because we're yeah. not selling them. You need oh. to go to Lathwaite's website and uh, buy it from them. But um, they are absolutely stunning. We're really excited um, yeah. the artwork that they created. And, and most of these wine advent calendars are like the size of a, you know, a, a, yeah. a small Christmas tree. So that is, you know, the fact that... And they overwhelm you a bit because you get like nearly 200 mil of uh, every single wine. But they're all like, if you get you get the ones from the, 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 the cheaper ones, it, it's all just like, this is a generic uh, uh, Pinot Noir from that. So, um, so yeah. Um, but, um, so so there are, there are wines in there that are 43 pounds a bottle or more. Um, and um, there are wines in there that are... Um, Very limited iconic. edition. So yeah, we would we would we would love to do one next year, but we've got we've got a cool plan for that next year. Absolutely. So should we have a little should we have a little look at the uh, wine of the night? Yeah, see how people are getting that. on with that. I can't see it from here, so that's exciting. Ooh, interesting. Mm. Um, we we haven't got a, a discount code for the advent calendar. If we do get one, we'll pass that on, on to you. But yeah, yeah it's Lathwaite's are selling out. It's, it's, it's yeah, not from the, us, to be honest, unfortunately. It's, it's just we, we thought we'd, we'd, we'd advertise it because, you know... We, we, we like it and it's cool. Like it, it's and the cool. wines are good. Cool. If anyone would like to buy us one and send us one, that would be great as well. I might yeah. like to ask. So what have we got? It's, it's fairly close yeah, at the it's, top. It's close at the top. It's um, always going in sort of numerical order, although the, the, um, the, 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 the noble Riesling is punching there. But uh, interesting, so... Isn't that funny? What's New Zealand famous for? White wines. Um, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm glad, though, that for once it's not the Sauvignon Blanc leading. It is, it is something a bit different. Um, the, the Riesling is a, is a really cool wine, but it is, it is super light, and that is actually a very pleasant thing in a lot of occasions. So how, how good Absolutely. is that? Absolutely. So it's light, it's fresh, it's delicious. Yeah. So 
A little bit of oh, central tug region. Should we pop the prices up for everybody? We should pop the prices up. Let's, let's pop the prices up so we can see where. And I think there's some really, some really, really, you know, good, good values in here for for what we've got, especially the dessert wine. Um, bear in mind, yeah. it is a three seven five mil bottle, but they're expensive to make. They um, are. There's a lot of work going into those. But there's and the grapes are tiny. You squeeze. There's nothing left. It's, <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. It's all the water has gone. The 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 the, the, the you know the. The process has just dried them out, and they're like tiny little raisins, and they 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 give you nothing, and you have to somehow turn that into wine. So that's why those are expensive to make. But, so um, absolutely. So yeah. so coming up, what have we got? So next month we are doing fortified yeah. wines um, because For Christmas. because it's December, we're going to do as a pre pre-recorded, so people don't have to tie in and miss with Christmas parties and stuff like that. So and, people and because can it's just fortified. You can give it as a gift. You don't have to keep it in the fridge because your fridge is going to be full of turkey and all of that stuff. It's just it's just fortified. You can you can give them as a gift. And we're, we're going to do diff two different ones uh, at our two different levels. Absolutely. If you want to upgrade or you want to gift something and you want to gift it at your membership price, just get in touch with us. and uh, We can you know, sort these, we'll things, sort out. these things out. Um, on other notes, at the end of this month, I am doing a tasting with Jay Law. So if anyone, mm -hmm. anyone who joined us on our Rivana tasting, um, it's a standalone tasting. It's not part of the, um, the club. Um, but Steve Peck, who's the VP of uh, J Law, um, will be VP joining me. At yes, well. so, um, yeah. will be joining me. It may be a Zoom call rather than a YouTube, but he will be joining me live from the states to go through some absolutely phenomenal wines, absolutely phenomenal yeah. stuff, and. The wines we're drinking are silly. They're they're sponsoring a fair chunk of it, so the price is really good, really good value, really good value <laughs> for what we're getting. Yep. Um, and then we've got Christmas, all fun. We might have a fancy schmancy tasting of some bucket list wines. I'm just trying to work the list together, which is a great gifting thing. Um, and then going into January, we're going to be doing some trends. We've got some wine and cheese pairings coming up to do again. So lots of cool, cool stuff things. going in. Yeah. Lots of cool stuff. So. As and always, it's a great value night in as well. As we all know, like it, going out to the pub and getting babysitters and taxis and things is, is super expensive these days. So, so why not tell your friends that this is a fun thing to do? And obviously, you can gift them subscriptions at Christmas. But we're going to stop trying to sell you things. Now, exactly, but. exactly. But as always, an <laughs> absolute pleasure. Thank, um, you. thank you for joining. Hope you've enjoyed the wines. Obviously, if you love them, buy them. Um, <laughs> and then. Uh, that's us. So, yeah. uh, have right. a wonderful evening. Oh, just, just oh, he's while, got I, said, I'm not going to try to uh, tell, tell you. He's what we're doing, what we're doing over the, the coming few weeks is we are um, bringing a lot more wines into our wine shop. <laughs> wow. Why did the table just do that? That's a bit crazy. Um, so, we're, we're, we're in, improving our wine shop to have a lot, a wider range of wines. Some of the ones we've done before, some of the wines we haven't done, uh, other wines from the same... Uh, producers that we've got on our tasting so 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 it's just easier to get up to that six bottle minimum so you can uh, so you can get your free shipping which is good so yeah do check out the store um, come back uh, for the next tasting and we hope that you have a wonderful month and uh, we will see you very soon indeed sounds good have a great night everyone <laughs> take care bye for now